and welcome to our midweek uh, Lenten service as we gather for worship together online today. Uh, we have some folks to keep in our prayers. Fred Mertens, uh, Ziggy Hensley, Jacob Earhart, Lottie Shukair, Anna Harris Parker, and the family of Alyssa Glass, whose grandmother died this past Saturday. Remember, too, that there's drive through communion today at 4.30, beginning at 4.30, from 4.30 to 6. Also mark your calendars for the annual Easter egg hunt, Saturday the 27th of March at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, weather permitting. I uh, plan to uh, do a tailgate style, bring your lunch and chairs, and hopefully not you won't need blankets, uh, and join us for fun and fellowship. Remember, the ladies are uh, conducting their personal care kit drive beginning the 1st of February and through April for Lutheran World Relief. Uh, a list of the contents can be found uh, in, at the church, or you can simply call Monica Proctor. Uh, her number is 706-339-6359. And she will give you all the information. And also, don't forget the Animal Supplies Drive, sponsored by Georgia Southern Alumni. Uh, lots of needed items for our uh, shelters in Aiken, uh, Columbia, and Richmond counties. Uh, and uh, those are the announcements. I'll make one more announcement. Uh, Robin Fingilli, who is our seminary field worker, is with us today. Uh, her, her, real her major assignment, of course, is teaching confirmation. That's the assignment for the second year field work, which she's doing, and she's also participating in with us in worship. So, let's begin our worship service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The word is near you. On your lips, lips and, and in, in your, your hearts. hearts. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. And believe, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the word of, word of Christ. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, you once called us to follow you, to be extravagant in sharing with those in need. And you told us, too, that when we do that, we are actually doing that not just for you, but also to you. Sometimes, th though, we wonder, how can we be sure? And it gives us cause to worry. But again, what, we, what are we really worried about? All that we have is yours, really. Help us, Lord, to be extravagant with what you've given us. Help us to lose our life to you so that we may find it. Amen. The first lesson is a reading from Ruth, the first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, 
there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judea went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her, her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, there, there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? Here ends the reading. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the Never mind.
The second lesson is a reading from 2 Timothy, the second chapter. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them said, when he saw that he was healed, turn back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Creator and our Redeemer. Lord, take our eyes and see through them, our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. I often stop by the fresh market. It's convenient, of course, to our home. And they have those Alden fudge bars, which are simply a delight. And they also have that great rotisserie chicken salad and those wonderful breads. And, well, you get the idea. Uh, lately, however, though, I enjoy stopping by for another reason. They have a young cashier there who is always happy and upbeat. She's very welcome and personable, and I expect everyone enjoys her happy greetings. Uh, one time she told me that when she gets home in the evening, she tells her family about all the nice people she meets at work. I'm certain there's a good reason why she meets so many nice people. And I expect if you have met her, then you would know why. She's a happy and grateful person. And that's the fourth of our smooth stones, gratitude. Now, there's not a host of scripture texts about gratitude, so the choice is pretty easy. The ten lepers. Uh, the text, of course, is not quite so easy. Certainly, it is a story about gratitude. But let's take a closer look and see what else there is there. 
Luke says it happened as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And that's important. Jesus had already told his disciples that he would suffer and die in Jerusalem. He is somewhere between living and dying. And he is going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. He is in this sort of liminal space, this in-between place, which is also where these lepers are. They are somewhere between life and death. On the outskirts of their little village, when Jesus shows up. But even though they've heard about Jesus and heard that he was a famous healer, they don't simply run up and fall at his feet. They shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They keep their distance. They follow the rules. The 13th chapter of Leviticus states those rules in no uncertain terms. The person who has the leprous disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head be disheveled, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And that's exactly what these lepers did. They dressed as they were told. They spoke as they were told. And they did not cross over the line that had been drawn to separate them from those with unblemished skin. They were obedient. But they did get up the nerve to ask Jesus to heal them. And when they did, he wasn't moved with compassion as he was in some other situations. He didn't even offer to touch them as he did the leper in Mark's gospel. There was no mud, no spittle, no talk of faith, just an order. Go, show yourself to the priests. And they did, disappearing as obediently as they had appeared. But on the way, something happened. As they went to do as they were told, they were cleansed. The scabs went away. The color returned. The feeling came back into the limbs that had been numb for years. And nine of them probably picked up the pace running now to the priests so they could be pronounced clean, so they could re-enter society, move back into the community, be restored to family and friends. But one of them turned around and ran back to Jesus and fell at his feet, weeping and praising God. This one was a Samaritan. Now that may seem incidental to us, but it was not to Jesus. As far as his people were concerned, the Samaritans were half-breeds. The illegitimate offspring of the northern Israelites and their 8th century Assyrian conquerors. Their religion had become as mixed as their heritage. and They were despised by Jesus' people. But here was one of them now, prostrate in the dust at Jesus' feet, thanking him and praising God. And Jesus was amazed, not so much because this one came back, but because the others did not. Were not ten made clean, he asked? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Now that statement's a bit confusing, isn't it? You see, after all, it was Jesus who told them to go and show themselves to the priests. As far as they were concerned, they were doing what Jesus told them to do, following the rules as they always had. But one was a Samaritan. And you see, he would not have to go to the priests. When he saw that he was healed, he cried out and turned back and did not rest until he lay on his face in the dirt at Jesus' feet, praising God and giving thanks. He made a spectacle of himself. Nine behaved like good lepers, good Jews, and one, a two-time loser, behaved like a person in love. And maybe that's why Jesus looked down and said to him, get up, go on your way, your faith has made you well. The word Jesus uses here is the Greek word sozo, which can mean your faith has cleansed you, has healed you, has made you well, has made you whole. Or it can mean your faith has saved you. 
And I think that's how this former leper might have described himself. He wasn't only clean and restored to society. He wasn't only able to be with his family and friends again. By running back to Jesus, by spontaneously falling at his feet and praising God, he had closed the circuit between the gift and its gratitude. And somehow that had saved him, made him not only healthy, but whole, and maybe even happy. David Steindl Rast, a Benedictine monk who, monk who looked like an 80-year-old Jesus might have looked, gave a presentation in a conference a while back, which is, of course, on YouTube, where he stood on a stage in front of a giant video screen looking very much out of place in his brown monk's habit and his sandals. He spoke with a heavy Austrian accent and began by saying, there's something you know about me, something very personal. And there's something I know about every one of you, and that's very central to your concerns. There's something that we know about everyone we meet anywhere in the world, on the street. That is the very mainspring of whatever they do and whatever they put up with. And that is that all of us want to be happy. In this, we are all together. How we imagine our happiness, well, that differs, but it's already a lot that we have in common, that we want to be happy. But his topic wasn't happiness. It was gratitude, gratefulness. And so he asked, how is the connection between happiness and gratefulness? Now, most people would say, well, that's easy. When you are happy, you're grateful. But think about that. Is it really the happy people that are grateful? We all know lots of folks who have everything imaginable that it would take to be happy. And they are not happy because they want something else or they want more of the same. And we all know people who have had some significant misfortune. Misfortune that we ourselves would not want to experience. And yet they are deeply happy. They radiate happiness. Are you surprised? Why? Because they are grateful. So it is not happiness that makes us grateful. It is gratefulness that makes us happy. And in that one sentence, that little Benedictine monk reveals the secret of happiness. It comes from being grateful, which may be why that one leper came back to Jesus. He was not only cleansed, but saved. You see, he closed that circuit between the gift and gratitude. Just like when you throw a switch, you close that circuit and make a light bulb come on. And you can understand how. If you've been healed of leprosy, you might be grateful. And your gratitude might make you happy. But what about all those other days when you aren't miraculously healed? When the real miracle is that you're able to drag yourself out of bed and get dressed and put one foot in front of the other? How do you find happiness then? When you receive something valuable and you receive it as a gift, you are grateful. The ten lepers are a good example. Jesus gave them the most valuable thing they could possibly have asked for, their healing. And he gave it to them free of charge. They received their healing and they realized it was freely given. Then gratefulness rises in their hearts. The same is true for you and me. When that same sort of thing happens to you, to me, then gratefulness spontaneously rises in our hearts. Happiness rises in our hearts. That's how gratitude happens. Now, none of us is given a miraculous healing every day, but each of us is giving something that is no less miraculous, and that is every day, every hour, every moment, 
we can learn to live gratefully by realizing that every moment is a gift and that every moment's valuable. We can open up those moments like birthday presents, one at a time. And when we do that, we have an opportunity to be grateful. Let's try it. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this moment. For this time, we find ourselves gathered with you. Thank you that the frantic pace of life for the moment has slowed, that a hush has fallen over our busy lives, and that we are here in a room so quiet we can hear ourselves breathing. Thank you that we can breathe, that most of our joints and muscles still work, that we can not only get into a church pew, but we can get out of it again. Thank you that we are not alone in this life, that we are surrounded by brothers and sisters who make up our church family. And thank you, too, for the ones we don't get along with so well. Amen. How did that make you feel? Do you see how that works? Do you begin to feel grateful for where you are and what you have? And do you see how when you begin to feel grateful, you can also begin to feel happy? That a heaviness lifts from your heart and is replaced by a, a joyful lightness that wasn't there before. What if? Our Benedictine monk and a supermarket cashier are right. What if gratitude is the secret of happiness? In every moment, there's an opportunity to be grateful or not, to praise God for what He has given us or not, to run back to Jesus or just put our heads down and keep trudging along. It's up to you. If you can learn to live with gratitude in your heart and in your mind, it can change your life. It will make you happy. Amen. you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And Mark, I see you have Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe, I believe in, God. in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born
born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward, forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all our sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Gathered by the Spirit, let us return to the Lord our God and pray for the church, the world, and all who yearn for new life. Forgiving God, gather all who have wandered from you. Bless your church, reconcile us to you, and lead us to be ambassadors of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant to all people a share in the abundance and beauty of your creation and teach us to preserve the pro and protect the world you have entrusted to our care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain those who rule the nations with your presence and guide them in the ways of peace and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bring healing to those who are sick hope to those who despair, and comfort to all who suffer, that they may know your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Deliver us from greed. Teach us to be obedient to your will, and lead us to seek out the lost and all who have strayed from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the gift of life. Comfort those who mourn and welcome to the eternal feast all who have passed through the gate of death. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have commanded us to pray, and you promised to hear us. Hear the prayers of your people, and grant us all that we need for the sake of the one in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
bless and keep you now and forever. Amen. Do the best you can. Lean on God. Encourage one another. Wear your masks. A new day is on the rise. Now, go in peace and serve our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.